welcome to the town of Pleasant Hill in Cass County, Missouri. Today is my 38th birthday. We're celebrating it by walking around Pleasant Hill, Missouri. We're walking through downtown Pleasant Hill. Today is Thursday, October 22nd, and it's the only 80 degree day that we have. Yesterday it was 40 degrees, and tomorrow it will be probably 40 or 30 degrees also. So such is the weather in Missouri. <laughs> So why Pleasant Hill? Pleasant Hill is such a fascinating historic district um, outside of the Kansas City area. Um, I just love coming to Pleasant Hill and walking around because it's literally like you're transported back into another time or another era and you get to see all of the original architecture from so many decades of the past and all of the old buildings that are still here. Um, I've also been doing some family history research and found out that I have some pretty neat family history in Pleasant Hill. So I've come here to explore the history here again and just kind of line up what I've learned with my research to what's actually still here today. We just had a quick view of the original 1917 electric power plant um, that was established. And um, here we have a, another quick view of an old auto dealership that's pretty much untouched since maybe the um, 20s or 30s. You'll notice that there are some historical markers and signs talking about Civil War events in this area. Um, this was a huge hotbed area during the Civil War. Missouri was a major state of conflict at that time um, in this sign. Um, basically, it's talking about how um, it had a profound and long-lasting impact the Civil War did on this area. And, uh, Missouri's location in Pleasant Hill, in particular in Cass County, um, within the state at this time ensured that residents would align themselves to both sides of the conflict, being both the Confederacy and the Union. So, I mean, that in itself meant there was going to be a lot of conflict. Um, numerous skirmishes were fought within the vicinity, and much of the original town was put to the torch by one side or the other in an effort to counter the activities of southern guerrilla forces under the command of William Clark Contrell, Order No. 11, issued by Union General Thomas Ewing, virtually depopulated the surrounding countryside. Uh, that affected Jackson County and Cass County and some of the other surrounding counties right here in this area in Missouri. Everything was burned down. Um, they call it the Burnt District because all that was left was chimneys and fires across the countryside. Everybody was driven out. Bledsoe's Battery, one of the finest artillery units of the Civil War was Bledsoe's Battery. It was commanded by Colonel Herium Bledsoe and he was resident of Pleasant Hill. Born in Kentucky, he moved at age 14 to Lexington, Missouri. In 1846, he joined the U.S. Army uh, Missouri Volunteers to fight in the Mexican War. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Bledsoe formed an artillery battery and offered it for service in the Missouri State Guard, commanded by Major General Sterling Price. The pride of the battery was Old Sacramento, a large bronze and silver cannon, which is on display here, which Bledsoe had helped capture in the Mexican War. Cast from Chihuahua church bells, Old Sac, as it was called, produced a unique ringing sound that echoed across the battlefield. The unit fought for the Missouri State Guard at the battles of Carthage, Wilson Creek, Lexington, and Pea Ridge in 1862. This historical marker talks about the history of the town of Pleasant Hill. Pleasant Hill dates back to Missouri's early pioneer days. As early as 1823, there was a trading post located two miles east of the present town that was operated by a French-Canadian by the name of Bloy. W. W. Wright platted the first edition to be recorded as the original town of Pleasant Hill on October 8, 1844, on the ridge near what is now the Pleasant Hill Cemetery. 
Pleasant Hill was an overnight stop for the stagecoach routes between Fort Scott, Kansas, and Lexington, Missouri. A three-story brick tavern erected by the Wrights in 1846 was a popular haven for travelers and is said to have had a beacon on top of a 12-foot pole that welcomed wary travelers to town. The town of Pleasant Hill was chartered in 1855, the Pleasant Hill Post Office Mural. During the Depression, a federal program was established to depict local his history in murals painted in U.S. post office buildings. One of America's finest artists, Tom Lee, was selected to paint the mural in Pleasant Hill. It depicts the return of a Confederate soldier and his family to their burned out farm, which was destroyed as a result of Order No. 11. The mural is entitled Back Home, April 1865. So, quite honestly, the Order No. 11 mural in the Pleasant Hill post office really hits home for my family because at the time of the Civil War breaking out in this area, they had been living here. They were farmers, they were well-to-do, they had a sizable amount of land um, worth some money, they had hired three farmhands, and they were also slaveholders, unfortunately. I will be interjecting more about their experiences as we go, but for now, I need to talk about the People's Theater. This is the neatest thing. This is the People's Theater in Pleasant Hill. Um, it is a historic building that was uh, built around 1909. The address is 110 South Lake Street. This building has housed a theater since 1909. In 1915, free Saturday matinees were sponsored by the Merchants for Country People. November 7th, 1916, it was packed with people waiting to hear the national election results coming in over a telephone line that was installed for that purpose. And by messenger from the office, the bulletins were read from the stage, complete with a six-piece orchestra. Finally, news was received that Woodrow Wilson was the 28th president. This theater now features country music artists from the local region. Just a few storefronts down from the theater, you'll find another historic building um, that it was built around 1880. Uh, it's at 100 Veterans Parkway. It had operated as a grocery store and a meat market up until 1981 when a delicatessen was added. The building was destroyed by fire in 1891 and rebuilt at that time. From 1984 until 2006, various tenants operated out of this building. And in 2006, the building was renovated as you see it today. Work on the Pacific Railway was finally completed all the way across Missouri in 1865, and the railroad brought new pro prosperity to Pleasant Hill. Although land between the hills was low and swampy, First Street was laid out parallel to the tracks and the business district moved from Old Town to what is now downtown Pleasant Hill. Is the historic 1903 train depot. The first depot was made of wood frame and it was built on the same site in 1866. It burned down in 1901. So in 1903, this building that you see here was built for the Missouri Pacific Railroad and it was called the finest in the state. In 1915, the Wells Fargo office here was robbed. The night man was shot in the arm. Three weeks later, in the waiting room, a gun battle broke out, killing a police officer and one bandit. The other robber was severely wounded and later hanged by a mob. In 1988, the Union Pacific Railroad gave the depot to the city. The Community Betterment took a lease in 1991 to develop a museum and small businesses. Today, um, there are live train tracks right in front of this building, and they're used by Union Pacific and Amtrak, mostly. Um, so the Amtrak does not actually stop in Pleasant Hill. It goes straight to Lee Summit, and it also stops in Warrensburg. So Pleasant Hill is bypassed, so it makes Pleasant Hill kind of a sleepy little community, um, which ha has been converted to a trail town thanks to the Rock Island Trail Spur. So more on my family's history um, in Pleasant Hill at the time of the Civil War. 
Um, what the situation had been was I have a great, great, great grandfather by the name of Little Barry Clay, and he was born in Kentucky. Um, he, at some point, married Amanda Moore, and they immigrated to Big Creek in Cass County, Missouri, which essentially later became Pleasant Hill. In the 1860 census, they are listed as having a couple of children, three farmhands, and five slaves. Um, this, again, the, the Civil War broke out the following year, so um, they were not in a good position. Um, again, they had a lot of land, they were well off, and um, they essentially faced the Civil War. I believe what happened was uh, my great-great-great-grandfather ended up sending all of his family back to Kentucky. It was around Lexington, Kentucky, or it was near Bourbon County, Kentucky. And he came back to Missouri and fought in the Civil War for the Confederacy. He was in his early to mid-60s at the time, and he uh, sustained many injuries. But he lived through all of the battles. He fought tooth and nail. He sounds like a very stubborn person. And later on, he ended up moving back to Kentucky after the Civil War, which is where he died um, from old age. Now, his son, who was named Andrew Morclay, um, he actually uh, came back to Pleasant Hill and established a life here. He took advantage of the fact that the railroad was booming in the town after the end of the Civil War, and he wanted to be a part of it. And um, I'm not sure if he served uh, in the war or not. He probably did, and I, my guess is that he was only in for a short time, and perhaps he got injured, because he ended up working um, as a pharmacist or a druggist in a pharmacy in Pleasant Hill, and that is listed in the 1870 census. Great-great-grandfather Andrew Moore Clay persevered after the Civil War, came back to Pleasant Hill, Missouri after Order Number 11 burned everything down, was part of the rebuilding process here, um, saw the trains get established here, and worked as a druggist in a pharmacy in Pleasant Hill. He married uh, Carolyn Chin in 1866 uh, after the war uh, in um, Lexington, Missouri, and they had about a total of seven children. He worked in Pleasant Hill as a druggist for a number of years, and then he ended up moving to Independence, Missouri, where he worked as an insurance agent. It's really old doctor. <laughs> My thoughts are, since Pleasant Hill experienced a lot of fires, he probably quickly realized how important insurance was at that early time in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s and so he invested his life's work into being an early insurance agent. Um, they lived in Independence, Missouri for many years until they finally relocated into Kansas City, Missouri, where my great-grandfather, J. Harry Clay, worked for the Kansas City Star for his entire career until he died in the 1960s. This neat building here, um, it was built in 1884. It's located at 135 First Street. Um, as I talked about, First Street was kind of a swampy location next to the tracks, but they persevered and built First Street right there anyway, and outlined the downtown right next to the tracks parallel to them. Diesel. Diesel exhaust. This brick was added on, or this block here, this stone block was added on later. It's an addition to this building, it looks terrible. You can see the original iron stair and column. 
and the upper facade is original. Um, so this is a, an early building. Uh, it, it looks like it's or it was built after some of the fires in Pleasant Hill. Um, it was constructed for eleven thousand dollars by John C. Norp. Uh, the second floor became the Norp Opera House, uh, featuring vaudeville, drama, and community functions. The ground floor became a grocery. In 1893, the Opera Hall was leased to the Masonic Lodge, then in 1904 to the IOOF Lodge. In 1909, the building sold to the IOOF, which used the upper floor for many years. After 1921, the ground floor housed variety stores. In 1929, natural gas was piped from Lone Jack, which is the neighboring town. The gas company occupied these premises for nine years, and in 1940, Johnny Johnson opened a dance hall on the ground floor. It is currently owned by a church. We just had a nice view of the historic bank building right there. It says 1908. So in little old towns like this, whenever you see gaps between buildings, it's typically the result of a fire having occurred sometime in the past. Um, that is especially true with Pleasant Hill. Uh, Pleasant Hill was once much larger on this street than it is today. Um, it changed drastically during the final decades of the 1800s and there were multiple fires. Um, there was no city water system or fire department, so many of the fires burned almost out of control and ruined a lot of property. Um, three fires in particular proved significantly destructive to the downtown commercial district. Um, 1888 saw a fire, um, seven buildings were destroyed on this street, or next to this street, um, next to the tracks, and um, there was another fire in 1891 on First Street. There was also a large fire in 1893 as well, and so it was after the 1893 fire that they finally established a fire department. As you can see from this plaque right here, um, it matches up with the dates after the fire. It says historic building built 1894. Uh, this is at 121 First Street. It says in June 1894, the new building was the home of a drugstore. The upstairs was occupied by a savings and loan company and a real estate company. In 1904, the upstairs became the offices of a doctor and a lawyer. In 1929, a bakery was opened downstairs, then a grocery. The Sharp Grocery was here from 1939 to 1958, followed by various businesses. Right next door is one of the oldest continually running pool halls in the state of Missouri. Um, the first building was destroyed by fire in 1899. In 1907, the present building was erected for a pool hall. It was constructed to hold a second story that was never built. The pool hall is believed to be the oldest in the state of Missouri still in operation. Signs were discovered under old wallpaper stating Kelly Pool, five cents per Q. 1895 building located at 117 First Street says from 1895 to 1913, Raleigh Brothers Restaurant was here. They had a waiting room for ladies in front and a dining room uh, being cut off by a row of palms. In 1904, the rear hall was added facing the Missouri Pacific Depot out in the back, um, enabling the restaurant to cater to the railroad traffic. In 1915, it had something new in town, a mechanical phonograph. This is an interesting thing. A railroad switch. Cool. Oh <laughs> Can be yours for three hundred and twenty dollars. That's pretty cool. I don't have three hundred and twenty dollars for a railroad switch. <laughs> There's a lot of neat stuff here. Arched openings from one thirteen to one seventeen gave Pleasant Hill one of the country's first enclosed malls. It has been an ice cream parlor, cigar store, confectionery, bus station, watch repair, and a drug store from 1936 to 47. It then became a variety store and later a restaurant.
This is one of my favorite buildings in downtown Pleasant Hill. Um, it is a surviving example of a high-style late Victorian commercial building in the downtown. And it is the Italianate style. It's two-story brick building with flat roof. Uh, pronounced cornice moldings and details such as cast iron window hoods accentuate the formal balance of the design. I just love the elegance of the details of this building and the proportion. Unfortunately, somebody replaced the tile at the front doorstep, but it still has the original cast iron step from St. Louis. This building was the post office from 1874 through 1890. Other tenants included an insurance agency, a variety store, a shoe shop, and the Commercial Bank, 1912. Since 1955, it has been a radio and TV shop, a photo shop, telephone office, watch repair shop, tile and linoleum store, and a fruit store. Businesses upstairs have been a bookstore, the office of the local dispatch newspaper, the Pleasant Hill Township office, a building and loan company, and living quarters. This building is almost old enough to actually have spanned that time period when my great-great-grandfather um, moved out of Pleasant Hill to Independence. It's one old door. <laughs> Historic Building 1881, located at 105 First Street. In 1858, John Armstrong purchased this and surrounding land from the U.S., knowing the Pacific Railroad would site its station here. Armstrong sold some land to the railroad for $1. By 1865, when the railroad began construction, Crazy. businessmen from yeah. Old Town wanted to relocate here. Portions of the site sold for as much as $5,500. This building, erected in 1881, has had many businesses, including a Western Auto Store from 1983 to 1990, operated by Phil and Dolores Grody. This town has always very much been based on transportation. It from the early to mid 1800s, it was very much a stagecoach type of town. It had ample streams and creeks and a lot of good land available for settlers um, when it was opened up for them. And then clearly with the coming railroad, uh, it just thrived on the horse and buggy and the railroad, the railroad traffic the continual train stopping, that just boomed the town. It grew the town uh, really big in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but when the automobile came around, that was another story. Um, at first, it was a novelty to have the automobile. So after 1903, um, up through the early 1900s in the 19-teens, um, it drastically went from a novelty where only a few people had a vehicle to where it actually became a serious thing, a serious commodity here. Um, so the stores and shops in this area started to reflect that and it brought massive change. So much change in fact that it reduced the number of passenger trains by the 20s and into the 30s and 40s. Um, it was clearly, uh, there were a lot of automobile dealerships and repair shops here. It completely changed the fabric of this town. And then when the train stopped coming here altogether, uh, that was a major game changer for this town. People really didn't have a whole lot of reason to remain here. Um, and today, uh, it's just a really neat <laughs> historical example where all these wonderful buildings would exist. Um, in, of course, they have opened up the old Rock Island Trail, uh, Rock Island train line into a trail now so that um, people can come here and enjoy the quiet and the peace that it brings. Uh, 
on the opposite side of the street here, as you can see, there are still some wonderful historic facades featured. Um, Citizens Bank still has its original tile at the doorstep entry. Um, some of the woodwork on the doors is just wonderful as well. Historic Building 1893, 124 First Street. This building was the home of the Citizen State Bank from 1893 to 1943. The assets were purchased and incorporated into the Pleasant Hill Bank from 1943 to 58. It was a shoe and dress shop in 1958. It became a liquor store for several years. Later, it was a small convenience store and then an antique shop. Taking a quick look inside the window here at the interior, um, it indicated that the last remodel uh, was 1913. So that's probably what, what year the tile dates from. Um, you can also see the ceilings and um, you can see they have hanging some pipes that could either be conduit for electrical or uh, light. it looks like it's lighting, um, extra shop lighting there. Um, I, you can also see this area here that stands out that looks like it, it used to be a vault. So that is the protrusion of the room into the larger space of this shop here, or this what used to be Citizens Bank. Next to the Citizens Bank you have a building that dates from 1900. It's at 126 First Street. From 1900 through 1915 this building was the home of various jewelry businesses, then the bargain spot, and in 1917 a shoe shop. From 1919 through 1921 it was a millinery store, and early 1921 it was a feed store. Later that year, Pleasant Hill Times publisher Roy T. Cloud moved into the remodeled building and continued printing the newspaper until 1961. After several owners, Jan and Chris Powell purchased the business in 1989. It has been a newspaper office continually since 1921. Real buildings in downtown Pleasant Hill that feature this wonderful leaded glass and it's still intact and it's just beautiful. I just love this and I love um, some of the brick buildings and their accents along with this and, and also the wood um, crown molding details. They're just so fabulous. One of the earlier historic plaques had mentioned Cary Nation um, stopping by this town about 1909 to talk about the dangers of alcohol. Um, I believe she did this commonly at that time, went around to various towns to discuss this and talk to crowds about alcohol. Um, it would have been easy to have train travel access to many small towns um, in this entire region at that time. So that was um, naturally Pleasant Hill being at a prime train access location um, provided a good stop for her as there were also liquor stores here at the time. So it was inevitable that that would occur, uh, that she would stop at this town and, and talk about that. Um, prohibition, of course, happened not too long after that, like a decade later. How they have the um, barber pole mounted here, even though it's in bad shape. It's not the original barber pole, um, but it's still really neat to see that. Um, this building was built in about 1890. It's 134 First Street. Since 1890, this location has been a barber shop. Half the building has been an insurance agency and a jewelry store. A new barber pole was installed in 1908. It is now in Miller's Museum. Commenting a little bit more on the Cary Nation and alcohol situation, um, this town was probably no picnic. You had a combination of all sorts of people from all different backgrounds, and again, it was a heavy travel town. Um, so it, it was truly the Wild West, as many of these towns were. Um, back in that era, 1800s, 1900s. Um, as we have already seen, there have been murders and robberies committed in this town. Um, they didn't happen just one time. They were not, like, terribly common, but they did happen. Alcohol probably played a role in some of that. It was just, 
you know, not an easy situation. There was probably also prostitution and um, other criminal activities going on. We have um, one of our last buildings in this row on the street, um, 1868, uh, 136 First Street. A bakery was here between 1867 and 1895. In 1891, a fire started up the street. Men were on top of 136 pouring on water from a line of buckets. A restaurant here was here in 1905 with sleeping rooms upstairs advertised at 25 cents gets a square meal. In 1920, a cleaning and tailor shop was on the ground floor. Well, it was rumored that the ladies of the night entertained local gentry on the second floor. In July 4, 1934, a night watchman shot and killed Robert Dolly, a local baseball player. After 1934, restaurants, including a white front, occupied the ground floor. Again, this is one of those buildings that dates back old enough um, to the time that my great-great-grandfather lived and worked in this town, so that's pretty neat to me. Here, our last plaque reads um, 1868, 141st Street. It, this was first used as a savings bank and housed banks until 1908. By 1890, the upper floors were used as lodge halls. Other occupants were dentists, real estate, loan, insurance lawyers, telephone office, and living quarters. The first floor has been a jewelry store, harness shop, garage, and machine shop, feed, produce, and cream buying station. Later it became Van's Furniture Store. large grass vacant area here next to all of the town buildings um, has historically been vacant. This had historically been a place where people uh, would put their horses and carriages and then later on when cars became uh, the preferred mode of transportation they needed a parking lot. Great birthday today walking around Pleasant Hill. I really hope you enjoyed this video.